Okay, people, let's get started. Please um, turn on your video if you're comfortable doing so. Otherwise, get ready with the icons. So, we have one final topic to uh, to discuss, and that is arc length of polar curves. So, call a polar curve is something where the radius is defined as a function of theta. So, as we change our angle, the radius of our of our of our, the radius of our points parameterized by uh, let me say that better. As we change our angles, the radius, which is the distance away from zero, changes. So if we have an angle like this, theta, then this point on this polar curve will exist exactly here. Okay. So, we've learned about finding the area uh, swept out by a particular polar curve. Um, now we're going to find the arc length of a polar curve. And it is an easier thing than, 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 than finding the area because we can actually just use a formula which we know. So, recall, we can turn a polar curve into a parametric curve. Just with this, so x of theta equals r of theta, cosine of theta, y of theta equals r of theta, sine of theta, right? And now as theta varies, we have this x of theta and y of theta that's describing a parametric curve, right? And it's exactly the parametric curve that that gives it's exactly the same as the curve described by this by this polar 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 equation right so we can instead simply think about this as a parametric curve and use the formula for arc length for parametric curve yeah so an arc length of a parametric curve we found was just this. It was the integral from a to b of the square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared, which just followed easily from the pictures, just just Pythagoras, basically. Yeah? So we can use this formula to get an arc length for a polar curve just by differentiating these expressions and seeing what we get out. So let's see what happens. So, oops, we need to consider this thing plus this thing. And if we differentiate our expressions, oops, I should change it to theta because we are talking about theta. This. So if we just differentiate these expressions, what we have, we have r prime of theta, cosine of theta, plus r of theta, and then we're going to have minus sine of theta, right? Just differentiating this thing, yeah, and all of that thing is squared. And then the second expression is differentiating the y of theta, right? So then we can have r prime of theta, sine of theta, plus r of theta, cosine of theta, right? And we just square that stuff out and see what we get. So we're going to have r prime of theta squared, cosine squared of theta, uh, minus two r prime of theta r of theta, cosine of theta, sine of theta, plus r of theta squared, sine squared of theta. Just squaring out the first thing here, right? And then I square out the second thing here. I have r prime of theta uh, 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 squared, sine squared of theta. And now we're going to have plus 2 r prime of theta, r of theta, sine of theta, cosine of theta. And the final thing is this thing, so it's going to be r of theta squared plus cosine squared of theta. And as you can expect, there's a lot of simplifications here, right? So we are going to put this together with this, right? So that will just give us r prime squared, right? So this is r prime of theta squared. We see that this thing here, let me change color, this thing here, 
uh, is cancelled by this thing here, so these guys just go away. Right? And our final thing to consider is this term and this term, and we put them together, and sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, so we get this thing is just r of theta squared. So we end up with a nice, easy expression. Yeah? And we could do this from first principles using exactly the same method, which we did many times of looking on a small scale, seeing what it is, and just doing a ribbon sum passing to the limit. But, but, but we already have a formula, so we just use it to uh, save ourselves this, this work. So, arc length of the parametric curve. Oops, not parametric, polar curve. Uh, over some range of angles, say a, b, is just given by the integral from a to b of the square root of this thing, right? Uh, prime of theta squared plus r of theta squared d theta. And just as a kind of reality check, let's apply this to a very simple example to make sure that we are getting something like what we'd expect. So the simplest example of a polar curve is just when we have a constant, right? So if r of theta was always equal to r zero, yeah? And let's do the polar curve going from zero to two pi, yeah? So if we do it from zero to two pi of this thing, I mean, this thing is, as you know, just a circle of radius r zero. So we know the radius is two pi r zero, right? So let's use our formula. So if we differentiate, we get nothing. So this thing will just be r zero squared, square rooted, the theta, and indeed that's just equal to r zero times two pi, which is what we know the answer to be. Yeah. So this thing seems to be the correct formula. Indeed, it is the correct formula. Are you with me here? Yeah. And all we did here was just a bunch of of, of algebra just to get that when we use this expression for the arc length of a parametric curve, it just happens to clean up rather nicely to this thing. So this is our arc length. And what is interesting, or what not interesting, but what is the case about this formula is that there aren't many examples where you can actually calculate this uh, and get a, a, nice, a nice answerable. This is example four. Find the arc length of the cardioid, which is given by r of theta equals one plus a sine of theta. Okay. So this thing is just a matter of putting it inside the formula, right? So this entire card here only took us from zero to two pi. So zero to two pi. And then the square root of the derivative of this thing. So if we differentiate this thing, we're just going to get cosine. So we're going to get cosine squared right here. And then we just have this thing squared by itself. So it would just be one plus sine of theta squared, and that's it. That's our formula. Let me add details because r prime of theta is equal to just cosine of theta. So this is the r prime of theta squared, and this is the r of theta squared. Yeah? So we just plugged it in directly in the formula. Yeah? Everybody happy? Cool. And then we just clean this up a little bit. And if we square all this stuff out, we're going to go sine squared, which we can put with this guy, and we'll get a 1. So we'll get, uh, and we'll have an also 1 from here. So we'll have 2 plus, uh, multiply this, we're also going to have 2 sine of theta. Which is quite an uh, annoying integral to try and evaluate. So we can multiply by the conjugate and do a lot of, a lot of work. Um, or we can just stop right there and say, okay. This is, this is something, and we can evaluate it uh, uh, with software or whatever. So that is the final topic, and um, it, isn't, it isn't a particularly hard one. You just need to know the formula. The formula is kind of natural. 
it falls out from the parametric formula. Put it again. And then you just need to apply it now. So not dramatically different than any of the other things where you have to calculate some quantity, arc length, area, whatever. We have a formula, we apply it, we do an integral. Cool. That's it. That's it for the uh, all the content of the course. So now we are going to start to review, prepare for the, for the midterm and for the actual final. So um, we have, as always, a practice exam. It is, it is really important that you've worked through this because any hard question on the exam has, has a hint, has a similar question in this practice exam. So if you don't work through this practice exam, know it very, very well, you're leaving money on the table. This is, there, there, are, there are points being given away in this practice exam. Okay, so it's an absolute basic thing to do. Work through the practice exam, know it backwards, know it inside out, and uh, that will help you a lot with the actual midterm. Okay, so uh, hopefully you're, you're, you're well into that. You've made a lot of progress with that. Um, I've, I'm going to spend the rest of the day and on Monday going through the practice exam, tr um, trying to identify the harder questions that, 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 that are there and, uh, and talking about them. I also offer a weekend review session if I have enough people interested. Uh, so, yeah, if I have eight people interested, I will do a review session over the weekend. I will send an email about it, email me back. If you're interested, let's say Sunday afternoon, something like that. Okay, cool. So let's start to do some of these questions. So practice exam. So the, let's do question three. And it says, um, in the Taylor series, of the function f of x is equal to log of x taken around a equals two, Uh, find the coefficient of uh, the x minus 2 to the power 3. Uh, I'm also open to doing any question that, that you people particularly want me to do itself. Let me know if there's stuff that you find hard. We also have office hour on Monday for that too. But let me know if there's any question you particularly want me to do that you found challenging. All right, so let's look at this guy. So what do we know? Solution. We have our log function, right, which we know what it looks like. And we are doing a Taylor series around two, right? So we are going to try and expand it around two so you know what that means we're gonna we're gonna put a, put this infinite series so that it's going to agree with this guy in some neighborhood of two perhaps a large neighborhood right so we put down the general expression of a Taylor series right so f of x is the sum from k equals zero to infinity the k derivative we're doing this at two right of a k factorial x minus this thing to the power k, right? And the first terms are, of course, f of two plus f prime of two, x minus two plus f double prime of two over two, x minus two squared, and so on, right? Now, let me write the third one as well. Plus third derivative at two over three factorial, which is six, x minus 2 to the power of 3, and then there's all these other terms. Now, that is, of course, the Taylor series, right? And it says, uh, find the coefficient uh, of this 
of this power, x minus 2 to the 3, right? So the x minus 2 to the 3 occurs here, right? This is the x minus 2 to the power 3. And the coefficient is this thing. The coefficient is this thing, right? So what we need to do is simply calculate the third derivative of 2 and divide it by 6, and that will be the thing that we need. Thumbs up if yes, thumbs down if no. This is a, this is a, this is a rather standard question of the kind where there are a number of the practice exams we expect to see something like this. Uh, I have many people not giving me icon feedback. Please give me icon feedback. All right. Okay, looks good. All right, so then we just do the calculation, right? So we can calculate the derivative of f. It's just log, so it's 1 over x. The second derivative is going to be minus 1 over x squared. And then the third derivative, it's going to be 1, uh, uh, no, it's going to be 2 over x to the 3, right? Because this is minus x to the minus 2. So when we differentiate, this minus 2 goes down, which gives us 2. We take down the power. Yeah? So this is this third derivative. We are evaluating it at 2. So f double prime, or f third derivative at 2 is 2 over 2 to the 3, which is 8, right? Which is 1 over 4. Yeah? And our actual coefficient is... Given by this thing, so it is one over four times one over six, which is uh, uh, tw one over twenty-four, I guess, and that should be it. And that is it. So that's option C. So all this test is that you know what a Taylor series is, basically, right? You know what a Taylor series is, and and then you can just calculate the coefficient in a straightforward way. There should be a straightforward question. However, it's it's one you might. It's a one that I that I can imagine some students get get kind of panicked about because it looks like a, a, a hard question, but it kind of isn't. Yeah. All right. Everybody cool with this? Yeah. All right. Let's erase. Do some other one. We are given an explicit series, given by this thing, right? f of x is equal to the sum from n is equal to 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n over 2n plus 2, 2n factorial, and then x to the 2n plus 2, right? That's a, that's a thing. Cool. So, and then it says, uh, then its derivative is and it gives us a bunch of options. All right. So, what is this testing? This is testing that you know that when you have a power series, it is just as good as a polynomial in terms of differentiating and integrating, right? And if this is just a finite polynomial, sum from n equals 1, 0 to something, you would say, okay, I'm just going to differentiate this term by term. And that's exactly what you can do in a power series. Yeah? It's exactly what you can do in a power series, so long as it's inside a radius of convergence. It doesn't tell you anything about the radius of convergence. However, if this thing converges everywhere, so you don't have to worry about it. All right, so if it doesn't say anything about the radius of convergence, just assume it's not an issue and just, 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 just differentiate. All right, so let's differentiate. So f prime of x is the sum from n equals zero. So sometimes when n equals the first term is a constant and it just vanishes, but in this case it doesn't because when n equals zero, we have x to the two, right? So we include the n equals zero. So you have minus one to the n over two n plus two, uh, two n factorial. Yeah. And then we differentiate this thing, we're going to have 2n plus 2, x to the 2n plus 1, like this, right? And we have this cancellation of 2n plus 2, so this is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 
minus 1 to the n, uh, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n factorial, like this. Cool. So, then he gives us a bunch of options for what this function actually is. Um, so, another thing this thing tests is your knowledge of basic, of basic Taylor series, so, or McLaren series. So, we, we, we know the McLaren series of e to the x, of sine, of cosine, uh, of, of, of uh, 1 over 1 minus x, right? Looking at this, then what do we see? Well, since the answer gives us a bunch of um, possibilities uh, that include e to the x and sine and x times sine, it could be to get the thing that we want, we have to factor out an x, right? No? Because that's one of the possibilities. So um, this is what I would do if I were you. So what, what do we have for possibilities we have? Sine, cosine, and e to the x. But we know the series of all of these guys, right? This is something you have to know. So you know that cosine of x is the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k of x to the 2k over 2k factorial. Right? We work this out. We know that this is true. We know that sine of x is the sum from k equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the k, x to the 2k plus 1 over 2k plus 1 factorial. Yeah, We know that e to the x is the sum from k equals 0 to infinity, x to the k over k factorial. Yeah, And we ask ourselves, what can we, what can we, ex what function can we build out of this thing given that we have these possibilities? Yeah? Well, since we're dividing by 2n factorial, it looks really unlikely that either this guy or this guy is going to have anything to do with it. No? On the other hand, here we have this division by 2 by 2k factorial, right? We have the minus 1 to the k. But the only thing which, which, is, which, is, which is out of place is that we have x to the 2n plus 1. But we can just factor out an x from this expression, right? So we take this expression here, and then star is equal to x over the sum k equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k, x to the 2k. So I've gone from n to k. I hope uh, you're okay with that. k factorial. And that is the same as star. We've just pulled out 1, one x. Yeah? And what are we looking at? We're exactly looking at x times cosine of x. Well, this is x times cosine of x, which is one of the options, and that is option E. Cool. So what did it test? It tested that you know how to differentiate a power series. You just differentiate it term by term. And it tested you that you know how to recognize basic trig series. And you have a cheat sheet uh, because of online exams. So you can just write down these guys, right? Write down the five or so Taylor series that, I've, that, I, that I said you should know. Uh, but I expect it, if you have a question like this, then it's probably going to be either sine, cosine, or e to the x. We're not going to expect you to do some really weird Taylor series or know some really weird one. Cool. Is everybody good with this? Yeah? All right. Let's keep going. Let's do question 10. We're going to go backwards and do earlier questions, but, but 10 is one that could be tricky. So assume a power series given by this thing the sum from n is equal to 0 to infinity a n x minus 3 to the n converges when x is equal to 5 and diverges when x is equal to minus 2. And the question is, which of the following statements is correct? And it gives us a bunch of options. All right, first let's, let's, let's identify what we know from the situation, right? So this is the real line. And we have, a, we, have a, we have a power series centered around 3, right? So this is 3. 
And what do we know? We know it converges when we are here at 5. So this is 5, it converges, right? And we know it diverges when we are at minus 2. This is 2, this is 1, this is 0, this is minus 1, this is minus 2. Okay, so we know about the, the interval of convergence, right? So there exists R bigger than zero such that this series again I'm changing from n to k converges if x is between 3 minus r and 3 plus r. And diverges if x is actually bigger than 3 plus r or x is less than 3 minus r. Right? That's what we know. So this question is testing that you understand this theorem and you and you see you see the logical consequences of this theorem for this situation. So we are centered here on three, right? There is some radius of convergence. There is some number for which this is true, right? So since we are converging at five, right, we definitely have that the radius of convergence is at least two, right? It's at least two, because if it was less than two, then, then it would not converge at five. That's part of the statement, right? So the radius of convergence, where we definitely know things converge, is everything strictly less than five, strictly bigger than, uh, what's this, two, what? This is one. Right? So if we are here, strictly between 1 and 5, then for sure it converges because we have to have that this r is at least big or equal to 2. Are you with me here? Does that make sense to you? Yeah? So, because it converges at 5, we know that r has to be bigger or equal to 2. That's what we know. Yeah? But we have other information. We know it does not converge here. It does not converge at minus 2. Yeah? So potentially the radius of convergence could be all the way from 3 up to minus 2. Right? Because we can still fail to converge if we are at the endpoint of the radius of convergence. At the endpoints, we have to check it out individually. Right? So potentially the radius of convergence could be uh, 5 long. Right? potentially be five long, but we don't know. It's just potentially, yeah? But it can't be bigger than five because if it was bigger than five, then it would have to converge at minus two. You see what I mean? Yeah? So, and we know that R has to be less than or equal to five, right? So if we are here, in this yellow thing right here, then for sure we are good. If we are somewhere between minus two and here eight, then it's kind of unclear. We don't know what's gonna happen here, right? But if we are outside this, then for sure it diverges because we know the radius is less than five. So outside here with absolute certainty, we know that we are not gonna converge, right? We are not gonna converge over here. Yeah? Okay, so that's all that we know from these hypotheses, from these pieces of information. That's all we can extract. Are you all good with me? Uh, are you all good with this? Is this making sense? Speak up if not. This is a classic kind of question, and it's a good question because it really tests your logic about what the consequences of, of the theorem is. So, then we have a bunch of options, and we have to see which one is definitely true. So the first one says that the series diverges when x equals minus 5. So when x is minus 5, then it's over here. Is that true, that we definitely diverge when we're over here? Thumbs up if yes, thumbs down if no. 
Everybody give me feedback. Yeah, because this is way past this minus two, where we know anything to the left of minus two doesn't converge. So for sure this thing doesn't converge. So does not converge. So when you're doing this, draw a picture like this, where you know the interval where it exactly converges, and you know where the interval where, if you're outside, it definitely diverges. Draw a picture like this, and then you will be able to just tick off the possibilities one by one, right? So this stuff is where it definitely doesn't converge. And minus five is in that, so yeah. Statement I doesn't converge. Statement B, the series diverges at x equals four. X equals four is right here. Does, is that statement true? Thumbs up if yes, thumbs down if no. Is that statement true? All right, it's indeed false, right? So if we are at four, we are in this region where it definitely converges. So it's false that the series diverges at equals to four. So second statement is false. Third statement, the series converges for x is equal to nine. Let's take a look. X equals nine is over here, right? It's to the right of eight. It's in the badlands where things don't converge, right? So that thing is also definitely false. Yeah? Statement four, the series converges when x equals minus three. Minus three is here. It's in the badlands where we don't converge, right? So that is definitely false. The series converges when x is equal to one. This is x equals one. Okay, thumbs up if you think the series converges, thumbs down if you think that's not necessarily true. Okay, so here at one, we're right at the end point of the interval of convergence, right? Yeah, what does the statement tell us? It tells us that if we're strictly less than three plus r and strictly bigger than three minus r, then we're okay, yeah? And for all we know, r could be exactly equal to two, right? Because that's all we know. We know that r is greater than equal to two and less equal to five, so r could be equal to two, huh? So if r was equal to two, then this guy is just on the endpoint of the radius of convergence, and therefore we do not know that it necessarily converges, right? We've seen examples where on the endpoints of the interval of convergence, it fails to converge, yeah? Everybody clear? This is a key point, and this is something they'll probably try and test you because it's a natural thing to, uh, to get this wrong. Well, that may not a natural thing, but it's a common mistake to get this wrong. Cool. All right. So, yeah. Um, draw pictures like this. Write down the statements that you actually know for sure. And then just think logically about, about the possibilities. And you should be able to do these kind of things. Uh, we've got five minutes. All right. Let's see what we can do in five minutes. Well, maybe I overrun just a little bit. All right, I want to do question five. Unless, unless you, 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 you people have a, a question you want me to do. So use the McLaren series or Mac series. To find the limit as x goes to zero of two x to the six plus three x to the seven over cosine of two x to the three minus one plus x to the six. Okay. This is another kind of canonical question testing your knowledge of uh, Taylor series. So how are we going to do this? So look at this solution. Um, we can expand out this cosine of 2x to the 3 because we know what cosine is, right? We know it's Taylor series. It's this or McLaren series it is minus 1 to the k, x to the k, oops, x to the 2k over 2k factorial. This is the series that we know. Yeah. So what we're going to do is stick in 2x to the 3 inside this and then see what happens. 
So if we stick in cosine 2x to the 3, then we get the sum from k equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the k. And now we're going to have 2x to the 3. Or that 3 better. Uh, to the power 2k over 2k factorial. Yeah? And let's expand out the first few terms of this. So when k is equal to 0, what are we going to get? We're just going to get minus 1 to the 0, which is 1. This is 1, this is 1. So the first term is just 1, right? When k is equal to 1, we're going to have a minus sign. And then we're going to have 2x to the 3 times or oh, the power 2, right, uh, over 2 factorial, which is 2. So that's when k is equal to 1, right? And then the next term is when k is equal to 2, so now we have a positive sign. And, well, actually, let's look at this. So if we look at this expression here, we, we see that we have a 1, and then we have a power of x to the 6, right? We have a power of x to the 6, yeah? So that when we subtract the 1 from this expression, we'll have an x to the 6 and an x to the 6 from this thing. And all the other things will be higher powers of x. Yeah? And I don't care about higher powers of x because it, it, it looks like that this thing as x goes to 0 is going to be something like x to the 6 on the top and x to the 6 on the bottom. And all other higher powers are just going to vanish. They're just not important because they go to 0 faster than x to the 6. Yeah? So I keep, could keep writing out these higher order terms, but I don't care about them because they're actually not going to be part of this story. So I'm just going to write the sum from k is equal to 2 onwards, right? So k equals 2 to infinity of minus 1x to, uh, let's write it like this. So 2 to the 2 is 4, so it's going to be 4k. And then this thing, let's write it as x to the 6k and then over 2k factorial, right? Cool, and maybe clean up a little bit. So what's this? This is minus 1, and then this is uh, going to be 4. It's divided by 2, so it's minus 2, x to the 3. And all of these things are powers in x, which are bigger than x to the... Oops, I'll do this right. This is power 6. All of these things here are powers in x, that are bigger than x to the 6. So we, we don't care about them. They're just going to vanish. Yeah? They're just going to vanish. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? So let's write this thing over here. So when you write out this, these expressions, it looks kind of complicated. But, but yeah, it's not... It's not it's not actually conceptually that difficult. Um, so when we are looking at this expression here, let's call this thing star, it is equal, so we're not gonna, I'm gonna take the limit later, so I'm just gonna write out this part here. We're gonna have two x to the six plus three x to the seven. And then this stuff, when we subtract a one and then add an x to the six, we're just gonna have a minus x to the six. So you have minus x to the six, and then we have all of these terms here. Yeah? And I'm writing them all out, but all we, we don't really care about them because, again, they're just going to vanish, right? So we're going to take x going down to 0, of this thing star, yeah? And if I want to be really formal, I'm going to factor out x to the 6 from the top and bottom, yeah? But informally, I just know that I don't care about this and I don't care about this, so the actual limit will just be this thing here, just 2x to the 6 over minus x to the 6, which is going to be minus 2. So I can just see that it's going to be minus 2 in the limit just from that, yeah? Do you see what I mean? Yeah? Give me a thumbs up if so. Thumbs down if not. Yeah? And if I want to be formal, if this is a free response, then this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to factor out an x to the 6 on the top and bottom. So I'm going to have x to the 6, 2 plus 3x, like this. And if I factor out an x to the 6 from the bottom down here, 
and at minus one, k equals two to infinity of minus one to the k of four to the k, and then x to the six k minus six, right? Over two k factorial. Just factoring x to the six from the top and bottom, right? So then I can kill the x to the six from the top and bottom because we're taking the limit as x goes to zero, so x is actually not equal to zero, right? So this is this limit, and as we let x go to zero, then the top is just going to go to two, and since all the powers here are, are non-trivial powers of x, right? Because we start with x equals two, so it's 12 minus six, right? Then x equals three, so then it's 18 minus six, 12, right? So all these powers of x are positive powers of x, right? And as we let x go to zero, then this thing has to go to zero. You see what I mean? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah? Cool. So then this thing, oops, I need to put the limit signs. This thing is the limit of zero is just equal to two over minus one, which is minus two, and that's the answer. Okay. So these questions are testing that you understand that the first terms of the Taylor series are determining its behavior locally because with this function here, the Taylor expansion of this guy, the first two terms of this thing, right, all the higher order terms are less important as we get closer and closer to zero, right? So we are expanding this particular function and the first thing is just this constant function one and the next thing is this x to the minus six. So it's kind of like bending it down like this. Right, and then all these other terms. Right, so this first two terms are the relevant in this story because we are taking this and subtracting stuff like this. And on the top is x to the six. So we only care about that. And then all these other guys just vanish. Cool. All right. So uh, I'll send an email about review session on Sunday. This is the accumulation of all the stuff you've been learning, right? So this isn't easy material. Uh, this is the real stuff. So uh, if you're finding this harder than previously, it's because it is harder. This is harder content. However, if you've been doing the work, and most of you have, you can, you can get very good at this. You can get very, very fluent at answering these questions. This won't give you a problem. This won't be something you can't succeed in. So don't get overwhelmed. Don't think that this is too hard. This is, this, is just, this is just putting all the pieces together, right? So we talked about sequences, series, power series, and now Taylor series. Yeah. So we have this powerful tool and we have all these stuff, all these things we've learned, we're putting them together. Yeah. Uh, and if you've understood all the individual components, then actually doing it is, is gonna be okay. So keep working, keep revising, remain calm, have a positive, positive, optimistic attitude, and, uh, and this should, should go fine for you. All right, that's it for today. Uh, have a great weekend. I'll see you all on Monday.